We are eight weeks into the NFL season, and I'm ready to say it. This team is different. What's up, guys? This is Derek Kirby with the Dallas Prospect, back with another Cowboys postgame show for you here. The win streak is alive and well, even though we found out just before kickoff that Dak Prescott was not going to be starting for the Cowboys. Instead, it was going to be Cooper Rush. Somehow, some way, in a game that no Jason Garrett team would have ever found a way to win, the Cowboys did exactly that that going into a hostile environment going to Minnesota and taking on a good Vikings defense with a quarterback making his first career start coming into the game Cooper Rush had one completion in the regular season to his name just three attempts worth two yards Zero touchdowns, zero interceptions. The man had appeared in like five or six games total and suddenly was thrust into the starting role because the Cowboys made a calculated decision. According to David Hellman after the game, Dak Prescott, and I, I have some reservations in this, I will say, but according to David Hellman of DallasCowboys.com after the game, Dak could have gone if necessary. But the Cowboys looked at the big picture and said, you know, that one seed race is very tempting, but we know we can't afford to risk multiple weeks without Dak for causing, you know, a, a greater strain or something to that effect. We need to play this strategically now, give him an additional week of rest and just see if we can just be competitive, maybe we can find a way to pull it out. And pull it out they did because the Cowboys win this game 20 to 16. This look, I'll say a lot here about this. This is a game the Cowboys found a way to win that they probably should not have won. And I'm not trying to throw shade at them by any means. The resilience this team has shown between the previous game before the bye week in New England and then now is incredible. Absolutely. The, the last two weeks alone tell you this is not smoke and mirrors. This is not a team that is just not tested yet. This is a legitimate contender because the defense is making plays. Now, they didn't force any turnovers this game, and it's the first time since I think week 11 of 2020 Big Game James had the uh, the stat out there. The first time since week 11 of 2020 that the Cowboys defense did not force a turnover. They still won. They lost the turnover battle two to nothing, but they won and they held a healthy Minnesota offense to 16 points. The defense is not smoke and mirrors. Not at all. Not at all. And yeah, that means by a merit of the turnover streak ending, that means Trayvon Diggs own turnover streak, seven straight weeks with an interception, had eight picks or whatever, seven picks through six games. That came to an end. No big deal there. We'll get into him a little bit more later on another noteworthy thing. But the Cowboys go into this game and they move the ball well, which is a testament in itself to Kellen Moore. Kellen Moore's stock as a potential head coach is through the roof, but the dude is still just like 32 years old. He is a pup. And that's not to say that some NFL team's not going to be crazy enough to try and hire him anyway. Look at like guys like Sean McVay. If you look at college, look at like Lincoln Riley. Young guys get hired all the time now because more and more the old heads that kind of ran the ran the show in the sport are being set to the side because the young, innovative guys, the offensive gurus and geniuses are taking things over. And Kellen Moore has that football IQ. He might have a water pistol for an arm as a quarterback, and that's why he never made it in the league. But at the very least, the dude has a mind for play calling and offensive design. And he really showed that here because Cooper Rush, I said, completely untested before, goes in 
and they move the ball up and down the field just fine. No real issues there. And the Vikings are a good defense. Like, their secondary is good. Their pass defense has been good. And yet the Cowboys moved the ball pretty smoothly. Here's their drives for the game for the Cowboys. Their first drive started from their own 25, so a touchback. They drove the length of the field, settled for a 43-yard field goal, which Zerline missed. They then had an interception, but they had to start all the way back at their own five on that drive. They had an interception about the 30-yard line, I want to say, in Viking territory. Uh, They drove then from their 20, got a field goal out of that. From their own 25, their own 25, their own 16, their own 20, their own 28, their own 9, their own 32, and their own 25. So they had to drive. They never started a drive in Minnesota territory. Obviously, a big part of that is the fact that your defense didn't force any turnovers. But they had to they had to know how to move the ball. And a difference in play calling with Kellen Moore and with this coaching staff versus the Jason Garrett era is they were willing to trust a backup quarterback, even such an unproven backup quarterback, in ways that former regimes just would not. They did not do a check down. The big play that got Dallas back into this game. So Minnesota goes down on its first drive, scores pretty easy, pretty uncontested. Dallas comes back on their drive, but they miss a field goal. They do eventually get a field goal there, but somehow, some way, despite a myriad of problems, including an interception by uh, by Cooper Rush that's tipped, he kind of throws it into a tight window, it's tipped and then picked by the safety coming in to help. Not a good throw, very, very risky throw, but... It doesn't bite Dallas in the ass because they go into the half down just 10 to 3 and they're going to get the ball. And in the first the first couple plays of the third quarter, the game is suddenly drawn back to even because good Lord Cedric Wilson is making himself a real fixture in this offense. Even when Michael Gallup returns, which should be any week now, I think probably next week. Michael Gallup makes his, uh, not season debut because he played in the opener versus Tampa, but makes his first play in a long time, his first game. I think he's absolutely more than ever the odd man out. What you invested in CD, how good he is. Obviously, the contract that Amari Cooper has and his value, this game really showed that, by the way. Absolutely solidifies the fact that Michael Gallup, he's a very nice receiver. He can go be a number two, maybe even in some teams, a number one receiver. But they're getting 85% of the production, if not more, out of Cedric Wilson than they would out of Gallup. And he's going to make a fraction of the cost that Gallup is going to carry after this season. So Cedric Wilson busts the game open, a 78-yard touchdown the, the corners are so, the safeties, excuse me, are so concerned about your star receivers on the outside that the middle of the field's wide open and Cedric Wilson beats his man. It helps that, uh, that who was it, Harrison takes such a garbage angle about the 20, the Vikings 20 yard line while Cedric Wilson is weaving in and out. But the point is, it's a quick strike and just like that, Not only do you get Cooper Rush's first career touchdown pass, but you get a 10-10 game. And it's just like, oh, okay. So Minnesota should be running away with this. They should not have been up only seven at the half. They should have been up comfortably. Instead, we have ourselves a real, real contest here. And, you know, say what you will. Cooper Rush, they said it in the broadcast. If there's one receiver on this team he is most comfortable with, it's Cedric Wilson because of how much time they've run the, the scouting team together. Cedric Wilson has been around for a minute. He just hasn't really had a whole lot of time to shine until last year, started out last year and then this year. So great, great for both of them. Happy for both of them. Cedric Wilson looks like a really good third receiver here. And, uh, you know, Noah Brown, they threw for him a couple times, too. He's made some big plays before as well. But if if you got one of them that you had room for on the roster, obviously, you thankfully had both. Cedric Wilson is that dude. Cedric Wilson made a hell of a play there. He had a great game overall, too. Not just the touchdown pass. He had a trick play where he threw made up for his underthrown pass to I think it was CeeDee Lamb even then 
a few weeks ago makes up for it later on. The Cowboys just get creative. As I said on that deep strike, it was a third and eight, I want to say. That's never a deep shot down the middle with a backup quarterback on the road, and especially after he's already thrown a pick trying to force a similar situation there. Never would a Jason Garrett team have tried that. Instead, you have the the coaching staff trust their guy and say, look, dude, we're playing with house money as far as we're concerned anyway, because by starting rush, we're already saying we're probably not likely to win this game. But if we are going to win this game, it's not going to be because we're playing things safe. We're going to let the guy take his shots down the field if they're there. It was there. They took it. And we had ourselves a stalemate at 10-10. After that, you get some responses from the Vikings. They move the ball a little bit. The Cowboys defensive line, they're getting pressure. Randy Gregory getting pressure relentlessly. But they're not getting home a whole hell of a lot. Like if you look at the the sacks in this game, Dallas only got there once and it was Randy, excuse me, Dallas got there three times. Uh, Minnesota got to rush only once, which is crazy. Everson Griffin, former Cowboy last year, that bad mouth the hell out of the McCarthy team. Uh, got him once because Rush kind of had a bad feel for the pocket, and by that point, Tyron Smith was out for the game with a, an irritation to his ankle injury, and that didn't work so well with his backup. But Dallas, able to keep things in front of them. Minnesota, on their opening drive, went down the field and scored. Never again. Not, not a touchdown. They settled for field goal after field goal after field goal, and even then... They were missing opportunities before the half. They should have gotten a touchdown. They got a big play. Diggs had himself actually a bit of a rough game today. Now, some of the penalties on him were, I thought, I thought a little bit ticky tack, but they got to him. And for a, a writer who covers the Vikings, he called two weeks ago after the New England game, after seeing uh, the broken play there where New England tied it up right after the Diggs pick six. He was proclaiming, oh, if I'm the Vikings, I just go after Diggs relentlessly. Well, I mean, they had some success and he didn't get a pick. So you could look at it that way and say, hey, it kind of worked. But Diggs also still had himself. It was uneven, but he had himself still an OK game. Let me look at his stats here. Uh, Trayvon Diggs ended up with. One tackle, one solo. Uh, I don't see anything there. I know, I know Thielen got to him a couple times there once that set up the last Vikings field goal before the half, but just still strong. I mean, even his bad games are still serviceable. So it worked out for them in that respect, but Dallas's defense was able to keep Minnesota out of the end zone and they kept everything in front of them. Dallas then nodded it up. I think at 13, yep. Nodded it up at 13 at that point. After missing his first kick, a 43-yarder, Zerline answered with a 38 and a 39-yarder. So suddenly you're tied up at 13. Um, you're tied up at 13 at that point, and you're in position to, to do something. Minnesota's last field goal that got them to 16 was aided by some very bad calls. I'm still going to remain on the point that I think Dallas is kind of drawing... They they didn't they haven't yet said anything to really draw opposition further from the officials, but I did see some plays here in the game, whether it was penalties not called or ticky tack calls that went against them that I thought were a little indicative of like mm, I could see for kind of the target they're painting on their back, even from the officials and league, why that might be overlooked. And uh, there were three penalties, like two unnecessary roughness calls that one of them was so weak. I, I really thought both were weak, but the first one was so weak. I couldn't believe they threw a flag on it. And then you had another one where uh, they got called for a roughing the passer when Terrell Basham. Now the ball is out of cousins hands, but Basham is full speed going through him at that point. Like he maybe could have pulled up about 10% at best and they threw the flag and it allowed Minnesota to march down the field to get another field goal to take a 16-13 edge. And at that point, you're like, all right, you got about three minutes left in the game. Can you do something with Rush? You really just had that one grand slam hit to Cedric Wilson. Could they really do anything more at this point? 
Turns out, yeah, because this last drive, it's not pretty, but it's resilient as hell. It's also, sometimes you just gotta have the ball bounce right in your hands, just, just in such a perfect way. And you had two plays on that last drive that worked out for you. Writing for Blogging the Boys, uh, Aiden Davis had an article before the year where we were trying to track the trajectory of how many wins the Cowboys would end up with. And he talked about how no matter how good your team is, sometimes you just got to have the ball break your way in certain ways. And twice on this final drive, that happened for Dallas. The first one is a pass that gets batted at the line of scrimmage, and it it doesn't fall into the hands of um, Biotish, but he's juggling it and he gets it to, like he never controls it, even though the announcers make it sound like he caught it and then lateraled it to Dalton Schultz. He didn't. But instead, he's kind of like pinballing it around and is able to kind of guide it to Dalton Schultz's arms. And because the ball is tipped, anybody is eligible. Again, it didn't matter. He didn't catch the ball. So it's it's a loose ball that ends up in the tight end's hands and you get a small gain out of it. And it's like, wow, okay. So it took what was going to be a a third and 15 and it made it like third and nine or sorry, third and 10, third and 11, something like that. And you're like, okay, okay. Well, that's pretty that's pretty significant. You get a strike then to CD Lamb that moves the chains. Then you get another crazy deflection. Immediately again, you get a bobbled pass that goes off of Breland's chest. He's he's battling, racing down the sidelines with Amari Cooper. It goes off Breland's chest. If first of all, if Breland is Trayvon Diggs, game's over. It's intercepted because it hits off his chest and slides basically in the crook of his arm bicepping up the forearm back up into the air and then Amari Cooper as he's falling down makes a juggling catch to haul it in it's a big big gain where it's just another one of those plays where you're just like dude to get in that situation things just have to break your way and when not one but two of those happen in the span of about four or five plays something is happening here next play Amari Cooper again big gain gets down to like the Minnesota 20 yard line and at that point, you're just like, they're they're not going for a field goal. And again, this is where it's so different from a Jason Garrett team. A Jason Garrett team is going to go, all right, this situation, I can't believe we're here with a backup quarterback. Hell, he would do this with a starting quarterback. He would do this with Dak. He would say like, all right, ultra conservative, risk nothing. If, some, if we break a tackle and go into the end zone, great, but we're not going to take any chances. Mike McCarthy, Kellen Moore. Even with a backup quarterback, they said, nah, screw that, fam. We're going to go win this. And they did. Like, they took two bad holding penalties on that final drive, including one where they had gotten down to, like, the 15, the Minnesota 15. They took a holding penalty to back up 10 yards. And they kept coming back at them. Biggest play of the game. If it's not the if it's not the Amari Cooper juggling catch down the sideline, if it's not the Biotish juggle to Dalton Schultz, Third and 15, third and 15, after the holding penalty, Ezekiel Elliott makes the best play I've seen him make since probably his, his, I almost said freshman year, I'm thinking college football, since his rookie year. And I would probably say that was the 86 yard or 83 yard screen pass for a touchdown at Pittsburgh. This is such a gutsy call. I mean, it's a, it's a check down effectively. Zeke's catching the ball on third and 15, only like four or five yards down the field. He has two big linebackers converging on him. His burst allows him, his burst and strength allows him to split what's going to be a sandwich tackle, a solid seven or eight yards short of the mark to get. And then he takes on another guy and he slips past him. He gets the first down and trucks ahead for like four more yards. Unbelievable play. Like as much, I have been incredibly critical of Zeke in the past. But I did say coming into this year, I anticipated a strong bounce back. This is the kind of back, like bounce back I thought he could have. Now, this play, I would have told you it was spectacular no matter the sense. And it's like to say, oh, yes, I knew he would make a play just like this. That's not that's disingenuous. I'm not going to try and project that. But I will say I thought he was going to have a bounce back year this year, even though I've been very critical of him in the past, particularly last year. But 
Good googly moogly, this was an incredible play. It sets Dallas up with a first and goal from like the Minnesota four or five. And then magic happens. Amari Cooper had gone in and out of the game after the juggling catch, getting his hamstring worked over. I'm still concerned about that, even though he keeps producing. But he's over there working with like first a massage gun on it and then like a tennis ball, like working it over on the knot in his lower hamstring. And he checks back into the game. And this is great here. Let me let me I want to have the exact quote here. I want to let Amari Cooper's words tell the story for you. So this is on the game winning touchdown pass here. This is a direct quote from Amari Cooper after the game. Quote, I've got a funny story to tell y'all. I go ahead. I'll go ahead and tell it. So I come back in the huddle. We were in, I think, double left, right? So that means I line up to the left, short side of the field. CD wanted the ball really bad. He told Coop, he was like, it's double right, right? Because that would put me on the right side and him on the left. And Coop was like, nah, it's double left, bro. And then CD was like, Coop, you want me to get this? I, I said, hell nah. <laughs> so that's how much pride I take in wanting the ball in those pivotal moments because I know I can go up and make a play. So CD Lamb, knowing exactly what was coming, what what uh, opportunity was presenting itself there, not just a chance for a back-to-back week for CD getting the game-winning touchdown, but knowing, like, dude, we've got them on their heels. This is it. And me or, me or Coop can get it, but, like, of course, I want it. I've got that number one receiver mentality. But credit to Amari Cooper saying, like, nah, man, people have criticized Amari Cooper in the past, like a couple years ago in particular, uh, when when their season was on the line in Philadelphia and him not even being on the field in that fourth and one shot to the end zone. I get that. And that was weird. That was a very weird moment. But here he is. And he's just like, nah, man, I'm not not only not only am I going to be out there despite a hamstring, I'm going to go get this. And you're not even going to take me out of position for this. So brilliant play here the situation by the way minnesota tried to make dallas run the ball they willingly put them in a situation daring dallas to run the ball and didn't matter that they had a backup quarterback in didn't matter anything dallas saw no no no. i don't care how many men are in the box and what that would normally tell us to do we're looking at the fact that we got amari cooper one-on-one coverage with this dude over here And that is exactly the matchup we want. Over the top fade to Amari Cooper for the touchdown with like 55 seconds left. Dallas takes a 20 to 16 lead. Unbelievable. Un, un, unbelievable to get that win. But even then, the defense has to close down shop. They have to hold it down. Now, obviously, Minnesota needs a touchdown, but it is. Never had a chance like they got a quick strike, I think, for like 15 yards to get close to midfield to to Thielen. And then it just went downhill from there. I forgot to mention on that drive by Dallas to get the touchdown. You had a pivotal mistake made by uh, by the Vikings coach whose name suddenly is for oh, Zimmer Zimmerman. Yeah, uh, completely. Mike Zimmer just completely botches it he calls back-to-back timeouts which is a five-yard penalty so it took what was that third and 15 to zeke and made it third and 11 now zeke's yardage pickup still would have gotten the first down even if he hadn't had that penalty but back-to-back penalties or sorry back-to-back timeouts which is weird and he even acknowledged after the game like yeah i kind of forgot i called the first one like what thankfully the officials caught it and actually penalized it Moved Dallas five yards closer, and it burned a critical timeout Minnesota needed for that last drive. Like, that was a complete brain fart that screwed them over because Dallas gets the touchdown, and now Minnesota has, what, one timeout to work with at that point? Huge swing there. And Dallas's secondary makes great plays. Minnesota keeps throwing the ball in the, in the not just throwing outs along the sideline. They keep throwing in the middle of the field and trying to trust their receivers to get to the out-of-bounds line, but the swarming... Cowboys secondary, Jordan Lewis, uh, one of them. I think Keanu Neal had one as well. Great tackles, holding the defender or holding the receiver down in the field of play and causing the clock to keep running, forcing Minnesota basically. They're in a desert. Now, Dallas, actually, in this is a this is a key point. As much as we've criticized Mike McCarthy for his situational awareness, game management, time management, all of that, I thought he did a brilliant job here. He noticed. At one point on that final drive, I think it was before the third down play, Minnesota um, had spiked the ball and he did not have 
Micah Parsons on the field or Randy Gregory. Jason Garrett probably just lets that go. He's probably just like, well, next man up. They got to go make a play. Dallas didn't do that. McCarthy said, whoa, timeout. Get them back on the field. And then boom, boom, back-to-back plays where suddenly Kirk Cousins is under extreme duress. Another tackle in the field of play. And then the final play never has a prayer. It's literally thrown out of bounds because play starts and Kirk Cousins is immediately running for his life as he was at times in this game. And that's it. That's all she wrote. Dallas gets a huge, unbelievable win. They move to, what, 6-1 and one on the year now through seven weeks? Incredible. The fact that you got to rest Dak an extra week and got a win is huge. But we keep talking about the Cowboys' defense. Not only did they go into a hostile environment and win a game despite not forcing any turnovers, which is rare. This defense has been most, most associated with turnovers and giving up yards. Like, they'll give up yards, but they'll get turnovers to offset it. Not, not last night. I almost said not today. It was last night. Not last night. The Cowboys defense held the Vikings to one of 13 on third down. That is 7.7%. Unbelievable. That is the sixth lowest third down conversion rate allowed in team history. And the last time they held an opponent to 7.7% conversion rate was 2013 against St. Louis. Yes, back when it was St. Louis. Uh, Other stats here. First of all, Kirk Cousins... You went out and got outplayed by Cooper Rush in your own house? Bro, Their heads are going to have to roll for that. Not just Zimmers, but heads are going to have to roll for that, man. That is brutal. Dallas passed, uh, passing first downs, Dallas 17 compared to just six for Minnesota. First downs overall, 23 to 17 in Dallas's favor. Rushing first downs tied at four. Uh, and third down efficiency, Dallas was 7 of 14 with freaking Cooper Rush. As quarterback, Vikings just one of 13. Un, unbelievable. I, I feel like I say that a lot. Other standouts in this game, Micah Parsons, first rookie in NFL history to have 10 solo tackles and four tackles for loss in a single game. He might have only gotten two QB pressures, but he was swallowing up running backs in the backfield and just all over the field. He worked a lot more in coverage in this game, but did a great job. He's also the only player in NFL history. This is from Bobby Belt on Twitter. Only player in NFL history with 40 tackles, 10 QB hits, and two passes defended through his first seven career games. This dude's going to be defensive rookie of the year. No doubt. No doubt. He is an absolute monster. And uh, he's making things happen. Now, you did have a couple tough blows here. I mentioned earlier Tyron Smith had uh, the ankle irritation. He was out for the rest of the game. We're going to have to see what happened there because his replacement came in and was not so good. He gave up a lot of pressures and he gave up the one sack as well uh, to Everson Griffin. And that's that's brutal. But at the same time, we're just going to have to see what happens there. There's weird. There's weirdness going on with Lyle Collins, where even though he was in, he's available. He's he's ready, but he's clearly in the doghouse with the team right now. And they only put him in once in the game, and they did that same thing where they had him basically as a fullback blocking on a run play, which was pretty amazing to see. They've done it before with, like, Biotish, but putting Lyle Collins there is a whole different mess, like a whole different, like, horrifying sight for a defense to be looking at. But he didn't play. Even when Tyron went down, you're in there like, wait a minute, we got two backup tackles in the game, one of which is really struggling, and yet you've got your fully healthy Pro Bowl caliber right tackle out there, and you're just leaving him out? He's clearly in the doghouse, or the team is like looking at trading him or something. I have no idea, and I don't think they would trade him, but he's clearly in the doghouse, and I do, there's no consistency necessarily with it, but I do like that they're trying to draw a line and just say like, dude... Mike McCarthy's been the coach for two years. You've played now two games, appeared in two games for him in his entire tenure. And you've had yet another uh, suspension, which you then made worse. You don't just get to walk in and get your job back. You're in the doghouse. I like that they're actually trying to do something to that effect. But again, taking a risk, risking a game that otherwise might have been, it was a winnable game. And if that was the difference, not playing him and playing the backup you played, That's not good. But other injuries you had, 
Jabril Cox might be lost for the year. It sounds like he might have torn his ACL. That is a that is a tough blow because not only is he a special team standout, he was part of why Dallas felt secure in letting go of uh, Jalen Smith. Now, Jalen Smith's already getting hit with inactive status in Green Bay. They are already realizing, oh, d- dude's cooked. He's got nothing. Anyone who thought Jalen Smith had anything left wasn't paying attention. They just saw the, the accolades and the clips from 2018 and said, oh, we can fix them. No, you can't. No, you can't. And Jabril Cox, you know, in the limited action he's got and the opportunities he's been able to show has been impressive. But this sucks. Like, this is a, a very good instincts, swarm to the ball linebacker, has made very good plays, not just on special teams, but, you know, the, the stop he made on third and goal against the Giants, uh, Daniel Jones. It's the play Jones got concussed on. Wasn't a dirty hit. It's just how they collided. And uh, losing him sucks. You're now a little bit thinner and weaker at linebacker, and you're going to have to deal with that. But we'll see what they do. So that that sucks. You had a scary moment as well on the second to last play of the game. Uh, one of the plays where the Cowboys made a tackle in the field of play that put Minnesota just in danger, danger zone. <laughs> Uh, you had an awkward situation where as Diggs is falling forward, his foot is out and a teammate's helmet strikes it. Looks like it's kind of on the side. His foot does like a, a kind of sharp wiggle, which is concerning because one, it shows the re- reverberating impact of the hit. But two, I thought it was on like the side of the ankle bone or like an awkward sprain. They're saying it is a sprain, although he will be reevaluated today. If it's if Diggs has to miss time, that's a blow to the secondary. Now, you did just get Kelvin Joseph back, so he played that last snap, and obviously nothing happened there, but it's one snap. Um, but I don't know, man. I, I don't want Diggs missing any time because this team, this defense, as good as it's looking, even though now it's starting to trend towards a stingy defense and not just an opportunistic defense that will get beat up on a little bit but will take the ball away a couple times. That's great, but I still want my best ball hawk out there. And uh, you got to have digs for that to be the case. So we'll see what happens with that. You've got Dak, who should be good to go next week now that he got an extra week that he didn't have to have, but was good to have. So, yeah, Tyron, you got to see what's going on. Diggs, you got to see what's going on. You probably already lost Cox for the year. You have other concerns as well that you need to manage. Cooper is a, is a big question mark for me. He obviously eight catches over 100 yards for him in the game winning touchdown. And he took over that last drive for the offense. But I really, really am wondering. That's the only concern I have with this team right now is like, dude, they're cooking and they're rolling. But some key injuries are starting to pile up. And they've been there all year, but they've been like shorter term things that they could work through. You can absorb the Michael Gallup injury that's kept him out for like seven weeks or six weeks. I guess seven weeks total, six games. Because you have Cedric Wilson and because you have Amari Cooper and CD lamb. And you know, if Cooper had missed time, which he hadn't, but battling the injuries he's been battling, if he had had to miss time as well, that would have been troublesome for you. And you would have been thin in your reserve there. But I think the Cowboys switching gears and running the ball as much as they did during that three game homestand kind of helped take some of that pressure off where you didn't have to lean on Coop so hard. But, uh, Shout out in this game, Cooper Rush, 40 pass attempts. Again, Garrett would never, would never. 24 of 40 for Cooper Rush, 325 yards, 13 and a half an average. Two touchdowns, one pick. He was sacked three times. Uh, Quarterback rating of 92.2. Cedric Wilson, I mentioned earlier, he had the big gain there. The 78-yard touchdown pass ended up with three for 84 and a touchdown. Sorry, it was a 73-yard touchdown. He also had a great play as well. We saw him try earlier this year where it's the trick play where suddenly he's going to throw the ball. He underthrew it to, I think he threw it to Noah Brown underthrew it. But if he had thrown to CeeDee Lamb up the seam, up not seam, up the sideline, he had a touchdown for sure. This time he did much better. Not only that, the play was slow developing and he had to not plant his feet and just throw. He had to throw on, on the run and threw a just gorgeous pass C.D. Lamb, it's a big gain. You do get a weird situation there where Harrison tackles C.D. Lamb and effectively puts him in what looks like a chokehold, just a 
baffling play. No penalty, no anything. CD Lamb, like he tackles him. He's behind him. He's got his hand up under CD's chin strap. Looks like he's in a chokehold. His hand might have just gotten somehow caught up in it. But CD Lamb's like waving to the official, like, yo, yo, are you looking at this? Announcers don't mention it, and the camera cuts away, and it's just never revisited. I don't know what happened there, but very, very weird thing. Great throw, though, from, from Wilson. Again, he might be their best trick play guy, but that's not to say he's a great trick play guy. More often than not, it's been kind of mixed bag, and uh, this time it was a great, great play from him. So he had a huge game. Obviously, Cooper Rush going for over 300 yards, including the game winner on the road. Phenomenal. His family was there jumping up and down, losing their minds. Awesome. Awesome win. Uh, Ezekiel Elliott, you know, this is another game where because the Vikings are a good run defense and because it was a backup quarterback, Minnesota was not going to go at at uh, Cooper Rush the same way. So Zeke, 16 for 50. It's only 3.1 in average, only a long of eight. But his blitz pickup and his pass protection, fantastic as always. And that catch he had was incredible. That third and 11 conversion to set up Dallas first and goal was so, so big. Like that's probably, I, I said it earlier, it's probably the biggest play he's made since his rookie year. And that is the best indicator that this is, I call him revenge season for Ezekiel Elliott. He's, you know, people say like, oh, people, people hate on Zeke and say he's washed and blah, blah, blah. No one said, no one would use the word wash. They would say he's not playing well and he's not playing up to snuff. I've said that in the last couple of years because he's not played up to snuff. He hasn't played well. Zeke, though, himself acknowledged, yes, he heard those people and that motivated him and he worked harder than he's worked this past off season to get into this shape and into this form. And it's paying dividends. That's not, you, you can say both are true. You can say, hey, he's not washed he still has value. And you can also say, but he has not played well the past two years. You know, I, I wrote a piece and it was uh, with the assist from Aiden Davis of blogging the boys, but I wrote a piece before the season started about why Zeke was going to have a bounce back year. And we pulled a stat showing his yards per carry were going to go up and that there was actual stat, uh, you know, data to support that and why. And it was brought up on the air by 105.3 The Fan, and they're going around the Cowboys Twitter. They referenced me and the piece by name, and that's cool, but they kind of poked fun at the, the stat and the logic, saying like, oh, I think I'll have a bounce back here, but it won't be because of that. You know, you can have a disagreement with it, but the fact of the matter is, Zeke has been as good as he's been probably since his rookie year, or at the very least, 2017 previous or prior to the suspension actually taking hold so yeah it's uh it's huge tony pollard seven for 26 as well so just 3.7 there the fact that they had to go so heavy on cooper rush on like put the game on his back and he delivered now he did get blown up and fumble it at one point where he didn't see the uh corner blitz he fumbled it and the vikings recovered it near midfield and that led to a field goal for them, which I said, like it got extended by some questionable penalties. But still, um, you know, that is what it is. You had that and you had the pick, but he didn't look like a guy that was overwhelmed by the moment. And that's a credit to, to him. You also have the unique thing here of Cooper Rush throwing the game winning touchdown to Amari Cooper, Cooper to Cooper. Amari Cooper targeted 13 times, eight catches for 122 yards, 15.3 average. One touchdown. The long of 33 was on the juggling catch. C.D. Lamb, six for 112 uh, on eight targets. Cedric Wilson, three for three, 84. Zeke, four for 23. But again, the 15-yarder was the big one. And uh, Dalton Schultz. Dar Dalton Schultz doesn't have that rapport with Cooper Rush, I guess. Targeted seven times, just two for 11. And uh, I kind of take um uh, umbrage with one of those because it's the deflection in which it absolutely was not for Dalton Schultz. It was a tipped pass. I don't know where he was going, but it bounces off Biotish about four times before it goes into Schultz's arms. So yeah, Zerline, two of three, mixed bag there. And uh, Micah Parsons, dude, 11 tackles, 10 solo, four tackles for loss. That is so huge, flying all over the field. 
Curse in his return to Minnesota. He spent a lot of time there. He ended up with uh, six tackles, five solo, and a tackle for loss as well. And, you know, Anthony Brown got cooked really bad on one play, a double move that Jefferson just rewarded him, or I guess gave him a, a freebie in dropping it. But he got cooked bad on one play, but for the most part, played very well. I like what I'm seeing with the Cowboys defense, the fact that they're getting stingier and outperforming it. They put up over 400 yards of offense to the Cowboys offense, over 400 yards of offense with a backup quarterback. And after the game, the Vikings, their coach Zimmer uh, was saying that, yeah, we watched a lot of film on Cooper Rush. We prepared for both quarterbacks. And then Xavier Woods, former Cowboy, contradicted that directly. Now, he had a pick in the game and he was kind of puffing out his chest a little bit, wanting to take, uh, you know, take satisfaction in beating his former team, especially if the circumstances were in their favor. But he was saying after the game, yeah, no, we didn't prepare at all for Cooper Rush. We prepared for Dak Prescott. And when we found out, like, in pregame that it wasn't going to be Prescott and it was going to be Cooper Rush, we qu- we quickly watched a few clips. But that's it. His coach is not going to be happy about him being that honest with the media. But... I don't know, maybe that allowed Cooper Rush to sneak up on him a little bit. I'll admit, I really thought, even as all the reports were stacking up in the two or three days leading into the game, I really thought you were still going to get Dak Prescott, or at the very least, it was going to be Cooper Rush with Dak on standby. But when they said Dak is outright inactive, that's when I was like, ooh, okay, this might be a loss, and this might be a game where, you know, I thought if Cooper Rush played before before the game, I predicted, like, if Cooper Rush does play, I think the Vikings win the game. And I, I had it, I think, like, 34 to, like, 14 or 17. I did not think it was going to be very close. And I thought it was going to be a second half kind of pull away from Minnesota. And I'm so happy that the defense stepped up and really delivered, that they were the difference. And that the offense, being a, you know, allowing the team to kind of stick around, did the defense helps the offense get things going. And I really thought with the first half, even though they moved the ball well, it was that strike to Wilson for 73 yards on that touchdown that I think kind of had Cooper Rush starting to vibe a little bit. And after that, he he became much looser, I thought. And uh, that that's a huge difference maker. Zimmer, Mike Zimmer after the game, says he screwed up uh, calling consecutive timeouts late and the Vikings lost. I forgot I had already called one. That's not so good. Not so good. Again, Bobby Belt here. All eight of Amari Cooper's receptions went for first downs on Sunday. By the way, touchdowns are counted as first downs in the NFL, as far as the stats are concerned. So all eight of his receptions went for first downs this week. Cooper is Cooper had more first downs yesterday than any other receiver in the NFL. Pretty nice. Per this is from Big Game James. Per uh, Pro Football Focus. Micah Parsons had a career-high 11 tackles. Big game, James, of course, saying, and he's been saying this the whole time since they drafted Micah Parsons, that he was kind of like the Dak Prescott of the defense, the quarterback of the defense, if you will. But uh, the pro football focus stat he's referencing says that Micah Parsons was the Cowboys' highest-graded off-ball linebacker, uh, did record a couple pressures, but his biggest impact came in coverage. He saw nine targets on 32 coverage snaps and allowed only 15 yards and one first down while recording four passing stops. Micah Parsons was a beast. He also almost had an interception, his first career interception at one point, which would have been pretty cool. But uh, it was a pretty insane play where the deflection and the ball was kind of behind him. It's almost like he was moving so fast. He moved himself out of position where a not so gifted four, three speed or whatever he is linebacker would have been in position still to make the fairly routine interception, but can't hate a guy, man. He, for, for how he's playing and how he's flying around, he is finding a way to impact no matter where they play him. And I think he is like James said, really one of the, one of, if not the biggest difference maker on this team. I have him Trayvon Diggs and I do have Osa, although he's been a little quiet the last couple of weeks kind of as a, for the future sense, a three-headed monster for this defense. Young, superstar caliber players. But Osa has gone a little quiet, so maybe right now you got two Ghidorah heads instead of three. But the fact remains, uh, Dallas's defense is in good, good hands thanks to some young, stud playmakers. But that pretty much sums up the Cowboys' win in Minnesota last night. I'll admit, 
I did not see it coming. I was not willing to give credit to Cooper Rush. I did not think that was the guy. I actually was thinking, you know, I'm glad it's not Ben DiNucci, but I kind of wondered if it should have been Mike White. Sorry, Mike White. By the way, he got his first start yesterday too, former Cowboys quarterback, uh, and threw for like 400 yards to upset, help the Jets upset the Bengals. Who knew? Uh, I thought it should have been Will Greer. There you go. Thought it should have been maybe Will Greer yesterday if you were going to try and gunsling it. But even still, Cooper Rush got the job done. Kellen Moore, brilliant play calling. Dan Quinn, brilliant play calling. Mike McCarthy, as far as his hands-on thing, he might not be calling plays. He might be more managing and building the culture of the team. But you can't deny what the dude's done in two years. This is not at all a Jason Garrett team anymore. And it's really intriguing to see how the culture has changed and how this team's attitude and general demeanor has changed. So yeah, don't forget to like the video, leave a comment below, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect, and until next time, guys, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace.